Welcome to episode three of Accelerated Startup Academy. Today, I'm lending my platform to important voices providing an education on racism because black lives finally seem to matter. The interview segment on this episode is with my good friend and one of the best known startup lawyers in Silicon Valley, Louis LaHoe. I've known Louis for over a decade as he has worked tirelessly to become one of the top go-to people on anything related to the all-important topic of law in startup land. Here we go, this is episode three. Thank you for joining. I'm your host, Vitaly Golomb, author of the best-selling book by the same name, Accelerated Startup. I've built a career in Silicon Valley on all sides of the table as an entrepreneur, investor, and now an investment banker helping fast-growing companies raise money and find exits via M&A. On this show, I cover important topics of the day and dig deep into practical and tactical advice from some of the best subject matter experts in the tech world. My goal is to help you unleash your potential by turning your ideas into products and those products into great tech companies. If you haven't yet, hit subscribe on YouTube or in your favorite podcast app, wherever you may be listening or watching this episode, and you'll be the first to know when future episodes drop. We'll shortly jump into the interview with Louis Leho, managing partner of L2 Council, on everything you need to know about Startup Legal. It is really good. You'll love it. But first, let me take a moment to talk about why black lives finally matter. As a species, we are still quite primitive. Groups of people still try to find ways to feel superior over their neighbors. This is mostly driven by their own hangups and insecurities. In reality, there's only one race. We all came from the same dark-skinned mothers less than 800 generations ago. As people moved away from the equator, their skin tone evolved differently. That's it. Now, I'm not black, and I can't pretend to fully understand the strife of African Americans. However, I was born into a Soviet Jewish family who then chose to escape to the U.S. in large part due to anti-Semitism. I was too young to have much first-hand experience, but my parents had plenty. The reverse of affirmative action, or quotas, uh, limits on how many Jews would be allowed into top universities, management jobs, or government jobs, which were highly sought after in those days, And in the one kitchen, one bathroom communal apartment we shared with five families, our drunk neighbor broke bottles on our door screaming, go back to Israel, you filthy Jews. There were also stories of pogroms from my grandparents' days and many, many other examples. Now, I'm proud and fortunate to have close friends all over the world learning from this wide variety of cultures, experiences, accents, colors, points of view is very important to me. And for this reason, it is difficult for me to understand why many people fight their perception of quote-unquote different instead of embracing it. Adjacent to this once-in-a-century global pandemic we're going through, we are also living through an incredible civil rights moment, a great awakening where the hopeful amongst us are seeing an inflection point greater than in the summer of 1968. I wasn't around then, but I read lots about it. The hashtag MeToo movement provided a social media era template for Black Lives Matter, and it feels like we're finally making progress. In part because uh, the Black Lives Matter protests have now spread to 3,421 global cities since May 25th, 2020. This is simply incredible. But to my dismay, I'm also realizing just how many otherwise successful, wise, and just generally nice people are woefully undereducated on the history of being black in America, what that means, and the institutional racism that still very much exists. Ironically, many of these people are immigrants themselves who escaped similar experiences to my families, but have seemingly forgotten that others still need help. So for this episode, I've compiled a short list of videos and articles that made an impact on me. I've uh, sent it to a lot of my friends and family, and I hope this will help you and those you care about. You can call it a curriculum on American Racism 101. Uh, You can read it on Medium, LinkedIn, and my personal website. I will put the links to the articles into the show notes and I highly encourage you to check it out. Louis Leho represents private companies, financial sponsors, venture capitalists, investors, and investment banks in forming, financing, governing, buying, and selling companies. He has extensive experience assisting a wide variety of businesses at all stages of development, from two founders and a laptop through venture capital financing to IPO and beyond. 
having advised non-U.S. multinationals looking to access U.S. capital markets for years, he is uniquely positioned to assist companies with cross-border transactions as well. I can go on and on about my good friend Louis. He is incredibly passionate about what he does, and he helps all of his clients and is very, very loyal friend. I am proud to call him a friend, and here's our interview on Startup Legal. Louis, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Vitaly, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. All right, so let's dive right in. You are a startup founder. You want to ruin your life. You started a startup. Startups, we know, are very special new companies that are designed to grow fast. And having a stable foundation is that much more important. From a legal standpoint, uh, what would you suggest doing first? Um, the first thing you ought to do is hire counsel. Uh, the, the, one of the most important relationships you and your startup are going to have is, 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 uh, with your outside counsel. Um, before you quit your, your job, uh, you need to make sure that you do that properly. You look before you leap, uh, and, and everything is in order. Uh, you need to select the right entity so that you're doing business in the name of a corporate entity that is appropriately stru structured for your circumstances, both from a corporate and a tax perspective, and that you're protecting your intellectual property. And Vitaly, the, one of the real challenges of being a startup fund founder is that your need for counsel is greatest at formation when you have zero cash. So the challenge is to find the right counsel that will work with you and the limited resources you have, um, who will defer fees, who will give you um, very clear project billing or, or fixed fees, and who really is gonna use technology enabled uh, services to replace human beings with, with technology wherever and whenever possible so that um, you, know, you can really um, reduce errors, and uh, reduce uh, fees as one of the most important costs that you also run up in your first couple of years is outside counsel. And so, um, you know, the best outside counsel understand this. Um, they work with a lot of startups in volume. Uh, they have people that work with them in volume across the specialties that they're going to need. And they provide project billing and, and deferred and flexible billing arrangements so that um, you can be comfortable calling them uh, when you need them and, and that your communication is not restricted to the times when the house is already burning. Uh, because that oftentimes is uh, is too late or or could have been avoided. Um, so th th those are my thoughts, Vitaly. Great, it's a great start. I think you um, you uh, you actually went into a few few of the next ones that I had uh, for you. <laughs> so as a founder, how do you choose the right lawyer? What what does that mean? Is it is it somebody that understands the technology? How does the process work? That's a great question. Um, lawyers are not technologists. Um, and so there isn't a lawyer for uh, companies that have molecules versus com uh, companies that have software platforms versus uh, corporate lawyers that, ha that, that have expertise in hardware. Um, now, they should have, however, at least uh, a handful of clients in the sp uh, specific vertical that you're in. So if you're an enterprise SaaS company and you worked with somebody that only works with life science companies there, I think that doesn't work. Um, they, they should have a number of, of companies in your vertical so they understand the problems that are going to come around, uh, the challenges that you face. And they're going to be networked with uh, both investors and, and other potential co-founders or sources of talent that you're going to need to, to grow and scale the business. So I, I think that um, you know, the, the, the very first thing is to work with a lawyer that comes well recommended by someone in your network that can provide a warm introduction. Uh, we lawyers, like anybody else in the ecosystem, are um, surrounded by great ideas and, and smart people. And, and for us to decide who we're going to pay attention to and where we're going to spend our time, it's probably going to be somebody who's made a warm introduction. Um, when you when you experience that warm introduction, you should have a good feeling right away. The person should be responsive. And remember, if they're not responsive, they may either have too many clients or have other issues. Um, when you meet with them, they, they should set up a meeting relatively quickly. They should provide uh, materials that give you a really good sense of their firm, their practice, and their personal background. Um, and then you should have a 30-minute uh, meeting with them, probably uh, in times like this over Zoom so with the video on so you can get a sense of them um, and try and establish a rapport. And, and you really need to be comfortable with them that you're going to be uh, happy to speak to them about the 
issues that arise that are really giving you concern whenever that may be. So it should be somebody that you feel is going to answer your call on a Saturday or a Sunday or late at night. Um, now, if you were doing that every night, perhaps that would strain the relationship. Um, but th there are times when you're going to need somebody who does that, and, and you're going to want to make sure that the lawyer that you select is going to do that. Um, the next thing is, 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 as I said before, you want to make sure that they have other clients in your vertical. And I would try and speak to one, two, or three other uh, founders or CEOs of companies in your space that they have represented um, so that you can get a sense that there are people that, you know, have enjoyed paying their bills and working with them, uh, Vitaly. Um, so that's that's how I recommend going about doing it. That's great. And, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a mystery behind large law firms that offer free services or deferred services. What's that all about? Yeah, great question. Um, so first off, uh, you know, the big problem that you're going to have is you're going to need the most amount of legal services um, at the time where you have the least value and the least amount of cash. And so you need to work with somebody that has a platform that can uh, serve you in the way that you need to be served, which means super leanly with form documents, with technology enabled freemium or, or light, light billing uh, services. Um, and you're going to need uh, somebody who's willing to quote you, uh, you know, a reasonable, a reasonably fixed amount of, of cost to, to do a service that you need. So, for example, if you're going to be bringing on a co-founder CTO and you need an employment offer letter and a confidential information invention assignment agreement and an equity package and a board approval to do all that, that should be, um, you know, very constrained and very understandable by your 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 lawyer at the at the outset and they, they should be able to tell you what that'll cost to do for you and that's the kind of relationship that you need now deferral um, it used to be 20 years ago that um, lawyers uh, would would take an equity stake in a company in exchange for agreeing to represent the company and uh, the good news for founders is that the market has been uh, uh, so successful uh, that uh, lawyers compete for the best startups and they no longer uh, ask for equity. Uh, at least most lawyers don't. Um, uh, but they will they, they will defer probably somewhere in the neighborhood of fifteen to to thirty thousand dollars in legal services just for the formation and the initial fundraising efforts. Um, no patents, uh, nothing else uh, commercially related, but just just to get you formed, structured, and financed. Um, th those are the kind of numbers that that they will defer, and usually not for any equity. Um, I, I uh, personally uh, don't ask for equity in exchange for deferral. What I ask for is the ability to invest if and when uh, I have I have the ability to do so, uh, just on the same terms as other uh, uh, professional investors and, and on the same terms. So if it's a series seed, I'd inv invest in the seed. I, I wouldn't ask for founder stock um, as a condition of signing up the company. And, and if somebody does, I would turn around and run. Um, uh, lastly, um, you want to be with a lawyer at a firm that works with a lot of startups so that they, that the whole ecosystem within the firm knows how to serve you, which means they don't uh, run up a $10,000 bill writing you a 20-page memo. Uh, they give you two bullet points, if this, then that, if that, then this. Um, which hopefully can be done in, in five minutes and that um, if, if, if a law firm has enough startups that they work with, they have a lot of uh, clients and that's the way they will serve uh, the startups, which is which is the way they should be served, um, you know, with quick, actionable advice uh, that allows the entrepreneur to focus on the business and expand uh, and scale the business and, and not, you know, get into the weeds of, of uh, legal minutia. That's great. So let's dive into some more details. Uh, let's say everything is great when you get a company started, you have your co-founders, et cetera. But mm -hmm. uh, we know that doesn't always end up the case. Uh, so how do you structure the company to avoid messy co-founder drama and breakups? Uh, great question. Great question. I've never seen any co-founder drama. Um, well, the, the first thing that we do, we explain to uh, founder teams uh, when they sign up is that we don't represent them individually. We represent the company. 
Um, we do not encourage each founder to get their own counsel and to sort of overthink it. Um, the general premise in Silicon Valley is that every founder uh, essentially negotiates their equity percentage in exchange for um, whatever role they're going to take with the company. And, and then their equity they receive essentially for free. They pay par value for the shares, which is, you know, a few bucks, but it is not real money. Um, and then they vest into those shares over four years. The theory being that if the if somebody invests uh, $3 million into a company and then the founders walk away the next day, uh, they shouldn't be able to leave with their equity because uh, there is no company without them. The, the, the investors put their money into a company on the assumption that the people would be there uh, and that they would earn their percentage of the company over time. Um, and so typically there's four year vesting uh, with a one year cliff. So 25% of your equity vests at the first year anniversary so that if you leave in the first year, you get nothing. And the, the idea there is that um, that is such a critical time for the company that it, in its development, that if you were to leave, then you, you, you know, the company really is so harmed that they would have to, uh, they might, they might not survive it. And, and two, they're going to have to have enough equity to replace you on the founder team with, with somebody else. Um, and then once the one year anniversary uh, has hit and, and you vest into your one fourth of your shares, you'd then vest either quarterly or monthly uh, for an additional three years. So you wouldn't be fully vested until four years. Now, that being said, Vitaly, even if you have vested, fully vested over four years and you go to market to sell your company and you have one of Silicon Valley's uh, iconic buyers uh, who's given you a term sheet to acquire you, which is fantastic news, um, they will ask you probably to revest again over you know some two to four year period to make sure that once they acquire you that 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 you're still there to make sure that the integration is successful and that the 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 um, business purpose of the transaction is realized uh, and so there really is a a, a a longer time horizon for your equity than just a year or two years and and there's not usually a, a quick hit um, so in terms of founder drama, what I tell people is that if you're if there is any drama, the company's probably dead. So whatever issues you have, please put them in perspective. Uh, that if you choose to to resolve those issues uh, at the uh, to the detriment of the company's success, then the company's going to fail. And I personally am the first one to say I resign if I see uh, intractable founder drama that isn't quickly resolved. And, and what I tell um, you know, CEO founders is to make sure that they that everyone understands on the team that that they are going to resolve that uh, very quickly and never let a cancer uh, grow inside of a company. And I find that you know when when uh, CEOs are 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 um, strong on that perspective that that they're able to, for the most part, uh, keep it to a minimum. Did, did I did I hit your uh, the answer you were looking for? You, you hit all you hit all the uh, all the points. I think uh, actually much more so. Um, appreciate that. So when let's say we move beyond the founders and we're hiring the first employee, what are just some of the most important things that need to be thought about? Um, great question. So the first thing I find is that um, my clients will tell me that they're bringing on their first employee not as an employee but as a consultant. And especially in the state of California, now that we've passed AB5, uh, which uh, is designed to put some brakes on the gig economy, um, a consultant will could, could very well be viewed in the rear view mirror as having been an employee, uh, which will make you, the company, liable for failure to pay uh, payroll taxes um, and uh, failure to provide benefits and all sorts of other uh, negative consequences that are to be avoided. So the, the first thing is if you are bringing on a consultant is to make sure that you have that person sign a consulting agreement uh, that your lawyer can give you. It's a standard form, which makes sure that everyone understands that the consultant uh, decides uh, when and where and how to provide the services, um, that, that uh, the consultant is not required to show up in the office at certain times every day and doesn't receive directions, doesn't report uh, to anyone other than delivery of the final product. Um, so let's assume then that you've decided that it's a consultant and you've um, uh, papered it properly with a consulting agreement. Uh, that should have a scope of work and a scope of services and a fee arrangement on, uh, as an appendix to it. Um, sometimes there will be equity 
uh, or, or common stock that'll come out of the option pool. Um, that's perfectly fine. Just got to track that uh, so that you don't exceed the Rule 701 limits on on equity grants. Um, and you make sure that you know, the company's intellectual property is protected by having them sign this agreement. Um, now, if it's an employee, as you was as was the premise of your question, and sorry for this uh, for long parentheses, um, you're going to want to give them an offer letter. You're going to want to enter them into your payroll system. Aha! Do you have a payroll system? Uh, you need to get one uh, because you're going to be responsible for at least payroll taxes and potentially uh, benefits and other things. So a lot of uh, startups uh, have been using Trinet for a number of years, uh, which is essentially a, a pooled services arrangement where you can pool together a number of, of companies and benefit from uh, the, the, the greater buy buying power of, of Trinet to, to get your, your, um, your benefit programs. And, and they provide a lot of the um, back office uh, compliance services. Um, but there are other platforms as well. Uh, uh, Gusto is one that's very popular with um, startups. And, and if you have a finance uh, function, uh, QuickBooks and, and uh, the Intuit family of products can, can provide that function uh, as well. Um, you're also going to want to make sure that that employee immediately signs what's called a proprietary information and invention assignment agreement, or a PIIA. And your employee is going to have a lot of confidential information. They're going to know who your customers are, what your roadmap is, and they may actually be innovating your technology. And you want to make sure that all of that information is protected and all of those inventions belong to the company. And, and so having your employee sign that separate document is, is really important. Oftentimes, it will also say uh, that the employee is, is at will and acknowledges that. And, 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 and in adi other circumstances, uh, we'll have the employee acknowledge that if there's ever a dispute uh, about the terms of their employment, that they will agree to resolve it in arbitration, which is a very controversial uh, subject these days, uh, whether uh, employees should be forced to arbitrate disputes with employers or whether they should have recourse to the courts. And uh, the theory from an employer perspective and, and you as the startup want to be able to resolve that in arbitration because one, it can be done confidentially in a streamlined fashion uh, more quickly and at less cost. Um, and so that's the argument for arbitration. The, arbit the argument against arbitration, of course, is that um, you know it's not done in, in the light of day and that uh, employees have less of an ability to um, receive justice um, in the arbitration system rather than the court system. And uh, that is a raging debate in, in society right now. Um, finally, um, you know, you're going to want to onboard them with whatever materials they need. Uh, make sure that they know who their reporting lines are and what their expectations are, uh, Vitali. And uh, people like you are, are very good at, uh, at, uh, at onboarding employees and, and helping them uh, get quickly integrated and, and make them successful. We try, we try. <laughs> it's been a while since I've had to take that burden uh, in my businesses. So, um, so let's talk real quickly. Um, maybe, I mean, this could be a topic that we could dive into for a whole episode, but how do you structure that first investment? Uh, you know, what are some of the very, very basics that uh, you, you help with startups? Oh, great question. Um, so at the very, very beginning, um, I, uh, meet with founders oftentimes when they're still employed uh, by somebody else. Um, I make sure that um, they're not using their their then employer uh, computer systems or resources to create or evolve the technology uh, that they would like to make into a new company in that they are very careful to comply with whatever agreements that they've signed with their then current employer and exit at the right time to make sure that the company can be successful without um, any question as to who the intellectual property of that new company belongs to. Okay, so that's that's something I do right before uh, we we jump ship. We so we look before we leap. Now let's say we were, we 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 are no longer employed, and we come. We I meet them, and they've got an idea. Typically, it's a business plan. And, and uh, the technology hasn't yet been developed. And so the capital that you're going to require to develop that, that technology is perhaps your own savings. Uh, perhaps it's friends and family that will be um, uh, making investments. 
Um, probably not because of their assessment of the value of, of the business proposition, but because they want to support you. And typically the form of that capital uh, will be a, a convertible note or a safe, a simple agreement for future equity. And in limited circumstances, that might be a gift. Uh, it might be for common stock or it might be a loan. Um, and uh, the, the, the problem with a gift is that there are tax consequences to you and the company for receiving a gift. Um, and, and there is, of course, no upside for the family member who, who, or friend who's provided it. And so um, that's not always a great answer. And so uh, common stock is usually not a great answer because you're, you're then asked to price or, or put a value on the company uh, at the worst possible time when it effectively is worth hard to give it any value uh, when it hasn't yet developed a minimum viable product or, or proven out that the, the business proposition even works. Um, and so we tend to, uh, in the early stages of, of what I'll call friends and family or angel financing, uh, Vitaly, land on either the convertible note or the simple agreement for future equity, which I think was the thrust of your question. So I first want to talk about convertible note. This is uh, the time immemorial traditional way of financing the early stage company. And it says that in X number of years, the convertible note will become due. It has a maturity date. Um, it accrues interest um, so that uh, over time, it increases in, in value to the holder. Um, the interest is accrued to the principal upon conversion. Um, and it converts upon some minimum threshold of equity financing that you raised at a discount. Um, and the discount usually was 20%, and it could be lower or higher depending on the circumstances. So you used to have a 4% two-year convertible note with 20% discount on conversion. That was your middle of the fairway um, investment. And the problem was is that starting after the, the Great Recession of 2009, companies learned to grow and evolve um, in a very leanly capitalized basis, and those convertible notes stayed outstanding for longer than two years. It took more than two years, uh, by the way they were being operated, to get to that equity financing. And so um, a number of accelerators, uh, Y Combinator, 500 Startups, others, uh, came up with a couple of different products uh, to resolve that problem. And uh, Y Combinator came up with the, the, the product that has become ubiquitous and is now, um, I would say, more frequently used than the convertible note now in technology startup financings. And a simple agreement for future equity is neither equity nor debt. It does not have a maturity date. It does not have an interest rate. And it does not necessarily convert at a discount. And, and finally, it may, um, like a convertible note, uh, have a cap on the value upon conversion such that um, the, the uh, early stage investor can capture at least uh, upside above a certain amount, above 5 million, 10 million, wh whatever we say is the cap on value. Um, and so the convertible note or the safe are the, are the two ways we typically finance early stage companies at formation. Now, if, if the company comes to me and they've already got a minimum viable product, they've already raised a million or $2 million of convertible notes or end safes, and they now have a product that's ready to be enter into commercial shipment, and what they need is now uh, seed capital that is going to help them scale to a Series A or Series A funding, um, either of these things, what I'll call as, as seed capital. Um, at that point, um, we may look to what is called series seed preferred stock, um, which is like a series A light. Um, it, it, uh, it, it, it is essentially tries to capture all of the, the, uh, the components of a series A financing with, with minimal documentation. And uh, uh, a former lawyer named Ted, Ted Wang over at Fenwick uh, uh, invented this product and put it online. Uh, I think it's still on a website called seriesseedpreferred.com or seriesseed.com, the documents. And there's a very wide disparity in usage of those forms. And I would say that um, I, I see them used uh, less and less. Um, and I use, see, see people using more um, uh, Series A uh, documents even in a Series C uh, deal. Um, so those are the kind of the, the, the traditional early stages of capital. And then, um, Vitaly, when, when you have a, a company that is clearly proven that they have a product that has a problem, that has a solution and a fit in the market. So you've reached a certain amount of sales and you're ready to, to go for a Series A financing. 
Uh, it used to be 10 years ago that that would have been a seed and it would have been up to five. And, and now I think series A's are larger and they're at, 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 for companies at a later stage. You're going to go with National Venture Capital Association approved uh, series seed, or pardon me, series A uh, preferred documents, um, which are extensive. Um, but but the industry is has uh, landed on what the forms look like and what the protections that investors get, and really you're you're negotiating for valuation at this point, and um, and control of the board. Um, I, I've gone perhaps deeper in the, into the answer than you intended. No, this is great. I think uh, when we publish this, uh, this is going to be a very popular Startup Legal 101 reference, uh, is my hope. So, I've had the opportunity to meet and train entrepreneurs in over 30 countries. I found that they're all pretty much the same. Tireless, driven, irrationally optimistic. They may have different accents, but the challenges are always the same. And I wanted to make all of these secrets of Silicon Valley success available to anyone. Accelerated Startup is my blueprint for you to go from idea to product to company the next time you want to change the world. Make no mistake about it, if you're working on a problem worth solving, by definition, no one has ever done exactly what you're about to do. This book is filled with practical advice that comes from years of blood, sweat and tears in the entrepreneurial trenches. Accelerators and business schools use it as a textbook. Thousands of entrepreneurs have used it as their guiding light to get past the challenges faster. So you want my advice? Grab your ebook, hardcover, paperback, or audiobook version on Amazon or iBooks today. And then send me an email with your questions at asa at golem.net. I know you're not a patent attorney and uh, people, a lot of people don't understand the difference, but I wanted to touch on patents just a little bit because it is a question that comes up a lot in my practice uh, with folks. And when, in your opinion, when do founders need to start thinking about patents and when to spend money on patents? Great question. So right at formation, we want to understand, and I, I immediately want to consult with an IP attorney to harvest whatever IP there is. So typically at formation, there is a trademark and a domain name, and there is the name of the company. And hopefully you pick a name that works both for the Delaware Secretary of State, for GoDaddy or Google Domains, whoever's hosting your website, and also is available on the website of the USPTO as a trademark and whatever symbol that you want to use or branding or logo is, is available with it uh, in the stream of commerce where you want to use it. Um, so so that's, that's something that, it, especially if you're going to be selling a product to consumers, you're probably going to want to con protect uh, early on. If you're, if you're really going after the enterprise market, perhaps less important at, at the outset to get that trademark because you can always change the name and a later one when you're really scaling into the enterprise. Um, now, patents, that was what you asked. I still want that IP attorney to, to do a deep dive with the entrepreneur for probably an hour to understand the business and to understand what which parts of the technology that is being developed is going to be protectable via patents. And it used to be, you know, 10, 20 years ago, Vitaly, that there was almost a race from formation to make as many patents as possible. And in your pitch deck, you'd say, I've got three patents applications on file or five or whatever it was. And, and you used a lot of that friends and family seed capital to write patents. And in today's day and age where uh, technology, at least, is much more um, code-based and software-based, um, you know, you're really not thinking about patents in the same way. Um, you're really looking to protect your ability to access a market rather than protecting a technology esoterically. Um, it is a defense mechanism, not an offensive mechanism. Now, if you're a patent troll, that's that's a different discussion, and, and nobody here that's watching this is interested in that. So I'll, I'll put that aside, just acknowledging it's there. Um, but but patents is, are not something that we necessarily want to go after right away, um, in, unless uh, unless there really is is uh, something that you need right away to go after your market. So typically, we see patents being filed, um, you know, I would say 
after a minimum viable product has has been uh, determined and after you've raised probably a million of seed capital um, and a patent typically costs you know just your first one you know 10 to 20 maybe even more for the first one and then less as you as you build on follow-on patents um, and, and you want to have each idea which goes after each market in a separate patent so that if ever patent is invalidated that you still have other other patents to protect your market and you don't want to put them all in one uh, patent application. Um, now, if we do determine that there are uh, protectable ideas, um, what we can do is, is, is very quickly file what's called a provisional patent application. And that really just requires, you know, a stream of consciousness white paper uh, where you where you put down your ideas and, and the applications and, and the applications to the markets. Um, and you put you essentially put that in your business plan with a cover sheet uh, to the USPTO. And from the date of filing, you have one year uh, to then file a full patent application, which is the thing that's going to cost ten dollars to $20,000. And when you file your patent, your full patent application, it will, it will give you the priority date of your provisional patent. And everything that, that happened afterwards will have been deemed to have been um, protected by that initial date. But the, the tricky part is, is that if you file that provisional too quickly, um, you may not be ready to file your patent within a year if, if you're um, Technology development requires a longer time to 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 come to market. That's great. Yeah, that's that's uh, one of the most common legal questions that I get. Founders, especially first time founders, kind of nosing around and asking for advice on. So it's great. Yeah, and if uh, I can uh, add to that, that, I think I think um, founders used to we used to think that a company might be valued in relation to the number of patents that it has, and that's just no longer the case. Um, it is it is a prerequisite. Uh, for you to have um, barriers to entry to protect your market. And if you need patents to do that, your investors are going to assume that you, you have got them or you're going to get them a and they value you accordingly. And it has nothing to do with uh, the number of patents that you have. Yeah. And the software speed just moves so fast that, uh, you know, the two to four years that it takes to get a patent might be completely irrelevant uh, at some point. So um, well, let's talk... Yeah, let's talk a little bit about fiduciary responsibility. As a founder, what legal obligations and risks do you carry? Um, great question. So one of the first things we want to do is is uh, make sure that whatever liability of the business uh, or of your idea is in the box uh, that is, surrounds uh, the business in a corporate entity. So that's why we want to form an entity uh, as soon as is prudent. Uh, as soon as you can uh, do so in relation to your prior employer or, or then current employer. Um, yeah, because, and, and then from that moment, um, whatever business you do should be done in the name of the company, and then you are protected from personal liability um, in, insofar as whatever liabilities the business has, hopefully that stays in the, in the Delaware C Corporation. And that it remains the case, except if you fail to pay uh, payroll taxes or you fail to pay salary uh, to employees uh, that you had promised to pay. And there, uh, uh, the state will look through a corporate entity and sometimes hold the directors and officers personally liable. Um, so, so now you're a director, let's say, of, a, of, of your startup. And what are your fiduciary duties? You have a duty as a director of a company of loyalty and care to the corporation that you formed. Um, the corporation is a separate existence to you. Um, it is not your personal piggy bank, um, especially after you take money uh, from other investors. You are supposed to be looking out uh, for the company's best interest when you act on behalf of the company and not for yourself. And so, um, you know, there have been many public instances of, of CEOs uh, in the last year or two um, who uh, failed to see that distinction and and did business in their own names um, uh, with their uh, startups and um, any uh, agreement that exists between a founder and the startup um, will be presumed to be an insider transaction and void or voidable unless approved by a minority of the uh, uh, pardon me a majority of the minority shareholders or uh, a majority of the disinterested board members. And so uh, it, it's very important that you 
um, right away, uh, you know, set up accounting systems to track the, the money that you raise and so that you can report to investors on, on where their funds have gone and, and you can defend yourself from any, any claim that you might have uh, violated your duty of loyalty, which should be to the company first. Now, as to your duty of care, um, that duty is to uh, show up uh, read the board materials, follow the law, um, uh, do what you're supposed to do, um, and, and do what a reasonable or prudent person would do in the same or similar circumstances. And so um, if you're an outside director, that means you show up at the board meeting and you read the board minutes and the board packs and you ask questions um, and you make decisions that are informed. Um, when you're the CEO, you probably are um, um, already doing all those things, I see less uh, of an issue there. Although, uh, when you see some uh, famous CEOs of uh, large public companies uh, doing strange things on radio shows uh, with illicit substances, you wonder if they're violating their duty of care. Um, hope that answered your question, Vitaly. That's yeah, great. We won't mention those CEOs on here. Yes. Um, but um, so let's say, you know, as we round the corner here, um, there are two two outcomes that uh, are likely. I mean, more than likely, the company won't work out and you have to wind it down. But mm -hmm. then if you're fortunate enough to sell your company, there's a whole separate legal process. So can you compare contrast between kind of what does a wind down look like that's orderly that most startup founders don't like to talk about and blog about, but end up encountering? And on the flip side, what does it look like when the company is sold from a legal perspective? Sure, sure. Um, so the first thing is is you 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 um, whenever you you are running a company, you should really have a good understanding of your runway, and and by that I mean the amount of cash you have. Um, you need to make sure that that can satisfy the obligations that the company has assumed. So if you have an employee, you want to make sure that you're able to pay. Uh, their salary for as long as they remain employed. And and if you see that you're no longer going to be able to, to do that, you let them know before they start working the, the next work period where you wouldn't have money uh, to pay payroll. Um, that's important. Uh, the second thing is you've got to make sure that the company pays its taxes. Uh, the government is very unforgiving uh, about failure to pay taxes, and there can be serious consequences, especially if those are payroll taxes as uh, the government needs those funds to on a on an immediate basis to to fund our our uh, employment and unemployment schemes um so so if you're going to be looking at a wind down um you need to kind of call it uh, at the right time. And, and where I see founders making mistakes is they, is they keep operating way past, uh, when they're cash out and, uh, they have employees continue to work when there is no money to pay those employees. And the employees are say that they're happy to keep working, but then later on they're not, um, never a good idea. Um, it's time to wind down or sell if you're not going to have enough funds to operate your business. So, uh, for the wind down, that means, uh, making the call, uh, terminating your employees, giving notice to your landlord uh, that you're going to be, uh, you know, vacating your lease, um, and and uh, it's also hopefully you're winding down your company, uh, which depending on your state of incorporation, uh, which probably is Delaware, um, also requires some attention. So it's adopting a certificate of dissolution and publishing a notice in a local uh, business journal. Uh, that you intend to dissolve and uh, that anybody who has a claim should come make them uh, then and there so that you can wind down the company uh, and go to sleep well at night that uh, a year or two down the road, somebody doesn't pop up and say that you personally owe anybody money. So that's the wind down scenario. Um, now, now let's talk about the sell the company scenario. There you're going to even need more runway because an orderly sales process to, to have any chance of success needs six months. Um, and it needs six months for you to prepare financial statements, for you to prepare an operating model, to prepare some sort of a, uh, an information memorandum, and for a, a banker like Vitaly to go out and, and solicit the market uh, for your business and to get the best possible price to negotiate the terms of a letter of intent, for a buyer to come in and do its legal and financial and accounting due diligence, 
and techni technical due diligence, and then to negotiate a definitive agreement, sign and, and close a transaction. And, and that, again, can take uh, a significant amount of time, like I said, you know, plan on six months. And so um, really, uh, when you when it looks like you're six months out, you, you've got to immediately um, come up with a plan where you're either going to raise more capital, you're going to look to sell the company. And if none of those things work out, you have a plan in place to to wind the company down. Um, hope, hopefully I, I hit the points you were you were looking for, Vitaly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is uh, obviously, you know, there's an end to a journey. There's a beginning, middle and an end to every startup, uh, it seems, unless you're building a hundred year company and there's very few of those. Now, um, I always ask because this is a show uh, with experts in particular subject matters. Um, I always ask uh, for non-obvious things that come that you see that come with experience in the legal realm. I think that's a lot of things that are non-obvious. But is there anything that uh, you can add as we finish here? Um, kind of parting advice on non-obvious things that you would tell founders. Um, you know, I, I, I think um, I, I'm going to go with the one that really is speaking to me right now, and that's um, being ethical and doing everything that you do with integrity. Um, this is a, uh, a very small community, uh, whether you're in Silicon Valley or Kiev, uh, whether you're in London or in Moscow, uh, people that build technology companies, that invest in technology, technology companies, that market and scale them, uh, that take them public and buy and sell them. It's a small world. And um, hopefully you're going to have uh, another company if this one doesn't work out um, or, or this one will work out. Um, but whatever you do is likely to to come back and have consequences. And so it's important that every decision that you make be taken with the long term in mind and, and that your, your decision will be questioned and that you always make it with a core set of principles that have at the core um, ethics and integrity. Um, so that you can always be proud of what you did and sleep well at night and have a very good answer. Um, if somebody asks, oh, well, you know, how come you, you know, terminated so-and-so or how come you shut this product line down or um, how, how come, you know, you waited until this time to enter this market or, or um, what, what have you. Um, but uh, treating people with respect um, and making ethical decisions, um, I, I think, uh, just cannot be understated. Yeah, truer words cannot be more spoken. So, or rather, uh, spoken more. So, thank you for that, uh, Louis. I really appreciate you sharing your time with us today. Uh, I think what we have here in the can is a is really a legal one hundred and one. I remember back to my college days when I was studying business, and I would take a legal one hundred and one class or law one hundred and one, and it was a semester long. I don't think it covered as much as we did today in in about half an hour or a little more. So. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much for being on the show. And I'm sure all of the viewers are as appreciative as I am. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Vitaly. And Thanks for checking out this episode of Accelerate Startup Academy. If you haven't yet, now is the perfect time to hit that subscribe button. If you'd like to learn more about working with me, visit golem.net. Now stay safe, productive, and supportive of the people you love and those who you don't yet know, but are in a position to help. See you on the next episode.